Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Design Cinema. This is Feng Zhu speaking and we are at part four of designing the sci-fi project demo. So this will be the last episode and then we'll move on to something else. Maybe we'll paint something uh, for, for a while or something. Um, anyways, uh, let's wrap this up. So last time we left it at looking at the human areas, for example, where the dude lived on Earth as well as the space elevator and uh, the space station itself. So a quick mention of that, I saw in the comments, at least the first day when we uploaded the video, that someone made some comments versus the uh, the realism of the space elevator. Um, now this is something you get into when working in this industry, the entertainment industry, is that you when you start going down, uh, when you start going down this road of debating what is believable, what is not, you could actually end up in a very deep rabbit hole because at the end of the day, nothing with design is real. Nothing with design makes any sense. It's there to entertain. However, there is a level of believability depending on the film that you're on. For example, if you're working on something like The Martian, the entire film is pretty much selling science. So they have to get their science almost all correct, right? They could have some uh, variables here and there for the sake of movie making. For example, Matt Damon, uh, he's on Mars, but he's still about the same weight, uh, even though Mars is a smaller planet than Earth, so he should have been uh, lighter. Uh, they sort of did that when he was lifting crates, but uh, if you look at the interviews with uh, director Ridley Scott, he did mention that it was way too difficult to mimic uh, lower gravity all the time for the film, so Matt Damon's like bouncing around. It was, it was too hard to do, so they forgo that part of the science, but they got most of the science correct. But for something like Old Man's War, for this particular IP, this is really about something closer to Starship Troopers, in which you're doing pseudoscience, in which like sort of makes sense, but nah, not really. It's there as a background really to tell a cool war story essentially that's taking place in space. So things like gravity, we don't solve it. You know, like some films will try to do the rotational orbit to try to solve gravity, but Starship Troopers, uh, you know, this, this film, uh, we don't solve uh, gravity. They just simply walk around and they don't float around. How is that done? You could use a couple words in the movie to say like, oh, our gravitational something field is up, you know, and that pretty much solves that problem. And that's how a lot of video games do that as well. If you look at, uh, you know, any video games, you can walk around in space stations. Um, what, how are they doing that? So it's one of those things where it's it's all up to the uh, film or how much pseudoscience you want to push in. So even though we had a space elevator, uh, yes, you need counterweights, you need, of course, gravitational system, all sorts of stuff. And then you start going down this crazy road. And my personal rule is that if the film has crazy stuff in it, you broke the rule a long time ago. Uh, and you have that in video, video games as well, or even fantasy projects. For example, you do something like, uh, 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 say, say Skyrim, right? I mentioned that quite a bit. It's got dragons. As soon as dragons show up, everything goes out the window because you're telling the audience this world is no longer in this particular realism world. Now, if you have dragons, you could break every other rule in the book. If you want to have... Uh, floating cities. You could get away with that if you want, right? So same thing with science fiction. Like in this one, we have aliens and stuff. So as soon as you have that, you break all the rules. You're no longer doing like, real, real science. You're doing pseudoscience, in which it uh, sort of makes sense, but yet it doesn't and it's there to sell the uh, story, okay? So hopefully that makes sense, especially for those who, who hasn't worked in the industry. You might think like, why does Hollywood make these dumb stuff? You know, why that makes no sense and that makes no sense. Because in the, the day, the people who actually complain about that is a very, very small percent. Guys like us, you know, we're, we're geeks, we're nerds. We know when things are not correct. We know when there's no gravity or Mars is too small. But your actual audience out of 100 million people, I'm guessing maybe a few thousand will have a problem with this kind of stuff and then the rest wouldn't. So I, I remember even watching, um, what's that film, Passengers. Uh, for those who, uh, spoiler alert if I ruin it, but these guys wake up in the middle of a spaceship. But I remember there's a scene in which the guy was in the observation room. I can't remember if it was a guy or the girl. They were in the observation room and the computer comes on and say, you are now passing the star system, you know, X, Y, Z, right? Then you start to think, why would they program this into the AI or into the observation deck when the ship was never supposed to wake up the passengers until it gets to destination? So why would they program that? That's like saying sending a ship from London to New York, everyone's supposed to be asleep, but they wake up halfway and says, oh, now you are crossing Atlantic Ocean to your right is a interesting phenomenon known as blah, blah, blah. Why would he have that, right? But at the end of the day, like I caught it right away when I fought the film. I was like, what? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? The ship shouldn't have this function. Everyone's supposed to be asleep. But at the end of the day, it was interesting. It was a big rotating sun or something that he passed. And I think they needed a dialogue to, to sell that. So it sort of made sense for that time. So it's that's that's how entertainment goes. It's We're selling overall the story and not every single scientific detail to be correct. So 
uh, this kind of stuff I could do a whole episode on because personally I love science stuff. I love it when films kind of do it and see how how real it gets. You know, like Gravity. You know that that film got a lot of science correct as well, but it also has a lot of stuff wrong. So, but that doesn't matter. The the majority of the audience don't care for that kind of stuff. All right, back to our uh, little IP here. So we're doing a Starship Trooper type of film here. So let's go back to the shield and sword design. So you've been, you guys have been staring at this screen for the past uh, five minutes. So what happens was I took the ancient shield which I thought was a good symbolism for defense and took an ancient sword which is a good symbolism for offense and used that to generate my design anchor points so I thought hey this is a great way to showcase a new way of attacking versus spaceship versus spaceship I thought might as well just build this giant ramming spaceship with all your little spaceships behind it so when they warp into a system they just simply bump everybody out of the way which is like you can see here so they warp into your planet you have all these little spaceships they just they don't care they just ram you out of the way uh, nothing you can do about it it's this huge strong shield and I think as from an entertainment point of view, I think that's something that the audience haven't seen before. You can make a beautiful shot in which you have this uh, still of space. You got a couple little spaceships guarding the, uh, the uh, warbit around it. And suddenly you have this boom, massive shield come through the warbit and just start ramming everything in, into the camera, essentially into the screen. And I think that'd be a beautiful shot. So that's something I'll pitch. You know, as a designer, that's our job is to pitch for these ideas. We could always scale this back to a, a regular capital ship if we wanted to. That's easy to do. But let's try something that has a little bit more um, entertainment value, I think, for the audience in terms of something new. Uh, here are the spaceships, the little swords that was inspired from. These are swords without the hilt. So they look really cool without the, uh, you know, the handle and everything attached. I thought that was a beautiful shape. So I converted those into the actual attack ships that are mounted here. So now I'll show you a few of the designs my designers have done, uh, men in particular. So let's load these up and you guys will see sort of the final result of these guys. Let's drop in this Photoshop. Okay. So here they are, these are done in 3D. So here's some early tests of what this could possibly look like. And I thought this is a pretty successful design. I think this is pretty neat. If we put in the film, it has a little feel of Star Wars, it has a little bit of feel for Starship Troopers. And that's sort of the vibe I wanna get off this IP if I was directing this film myself, is that it doesn't, it's about being cool. It's about being badass. It's about being just, you know, fighting aliens with big guns and so forth. And I think this kind of pulls it off a little bit. So here's the, these mega shields. Here's the capital ships kind of behind it. And we could kind of argue that these shields are expendable. So once they, they use it up, they just leave it behind. All these ships go home and they attach themselves to another one and come back and ram your planet again with it. So ram your uh, outer orbits with it. So here you can see some of these ships out here separating uh, as the big shields come in. Uh, let's see, let's look at it. We tried the transparent test, which looked kind of cool too. Uh, maybe some of the ships are transparent, which would be pretty neat where they turn uh, opaque once they go into battle mode. Who knows, right? This is far away technology. Uh, the book actually mentions that as well. It's like the humans on board don't even know how this stuff works. They're utilizing alien technology for a lot of this type of um, uh, designs here. So here's the 3D mockup of the uh, sword ships that the humans are using. So very slick, very smooth. Here's another render of the uh, the shield uh, opening up. So they might travel at war warp in a spherical pattern. And once they enter your warbit, they'll separate and start the attack run. So you can see the uh, little thrusters here pushing them apart. And one of the ships here is starting to leave its uh, home. The one has already left on this one. And they're going to basically ram you, destroy all your protective ships, and then let all their swords come out and unload a bunch of troops onto your surface of planet. So to to fully kick your butt essentially. So here's one of the ships leaving here. So I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, from a from a one week design project, uh, I thought this is actually somewhat interesting. Uh, this is something in the real world. We'll show this to the directors and then we'll see like, is this the direction we wanna push? And we could do another, you know, a month, two month worth of exploration. Uh, maybe keep some of this around or we switch back to a giant capital ship, you know? So it all depends on the, what we want to do with this IP. Here's another render. Uh, beautiful shot, I thought, with a little tiny ship here for scale. And then here's this massive uh, shield ship, you know? And we still kept the name Harry, uh, Henry Hudson on it. That was the ship in the book. So I thought it was quite cool. Um, I'll show you a few more here. Well, where, where my folders go? Okay, here's one that's uh, sort of being under attack. What? 3D paint. <clears throat> Photoshop. Okay, so here's one in which they, uh, the outer surface is starting to get destroyed from ramming and being attacked, and they just let it go. Um, 
the ships just leave and they let the shield d disintegrate in the atmosphere and they just go find another one. So um, so that's that. Show sure you guys can close this one. Uh, here's uh, again here's a rough. You guys can take a look. So I'll put these up. I'll put all these up maybe on my Facebook page or something when uh, when this episode is wrapped up so you guys can get to see them without in being a video. Um, we started some very early alien attack. Yuck. Sorry about that. Some alien attack runs. So here's some comps. Really early stuff. Again, we ran out of time. We had about literally three, four days to do these things. So uh, my designer the team, they generate about 30 images in the amount of time, which is quite impressive. So, so we didn't have really time to tweak any of this, but uh, the feels, whoops, what am I doing? So the feel of it is pretty okay. So we took one of these. I thought this one felt pretty good. So that was then turned into a more refined production painting showing these guys uh, landing on an alien world, very Starship Trooper-like. And uh, again, that's the vibe I got from the book is that the author was really trying to get that kind of the troopers uh, look into this world. So here's the sword ships coming in for a landing. It's all like Normandy style on an alien planet. Uh, here's the orbital ship way out there, the big giant ramming device. Uh, here's some aliens getting their butts kicked and killing some uh, some marines here. So uh, I, from reading the book, you get the sense that these guys are all expendable. They do mention that nobody lives beyond probably two to three years. So these guys are not Iron Man. They're not superheroes. They are armed to the teeth, but they're not you know, indestructible like like you're sending an Iron Man character onto the surface. So everybody just dies, 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 dies. Oh, by the way, I mentioned Star Trek Troopers. The Star Trek Troopers, the the movie version, which they have a lot of troops. In the book version, actually one of the troops is like an Iron Man. All you gotta do is send one dude in and he'll cover, I think it was like a 50 mile or 100 mile radius all by himself. Uh, but the but the film version, everybody became ants essentially, you know, uh, expendable everywhere. So, um, so yeah, so this is this painting here. I'll also show you guys uh, some of the, we start to get into some of the costumes as well, which is quite fun. So tight outfits, mostly for films. You notice a lot of films, especially science fiction, anything that requires a lot of CGI, the clothing tend to start tightening up. This has a, a few factors why that is. One is that if these actors work out or you know uh, they look good in a tight outfit, they generally want to showcase that. That's one factor. The other one is for the ease of uh, CGI stuff. So if you have a lot of cloth, a lot of things flying around and these guys have to do combat, uh, jumping around on rocks, which all will be replaced by a digital actor. The more stuff they have on their bodies, the harder it is to simulate that type of things. So you tend to see like Marvel films and all these things. Uh, of course, it comes from comic books, but it actually makes the CG a little bit easier if they're a little bit skin tight. So, um, and also I kind of want this tech to be look kind of cool, like special forces. And then they, of course they have backpacks and all these guns and everything on there. So this is all, all done by a designer named Charles here. So um, we came up with some stuff like shoulder mounted clips and so forth. As end of the day, everything we do is visual. What I mean by that is like in that far of the future, uh, everything could be hidden. And this goes back to our argument of the space elevators, like how real is real. But in this type of film, it's all visual. It's not meant to be real. For example, they still use guns that use bullets. Um, by then, hundred, few hundred years from now, I don't think they'll be using bullets for anything. But bullets make it very easy to showcase war to showcase impact, to, to get the things that the audience generally understand how it works. Um, for example, we look at Avatar, which takes place, what, 100 years in the future? Or 150? They're still using Vietnam era weaponry. You know, they have the huge, the mounted uh, M60 machine gun and so forth. Why is it doing that? There's two folds. One, it's, it's very um, impactful. It's very weaponry, right? Is that the word? Uh, so the audience sees that this is a threat. And secondly, James Cameron wanted that contrast. He wanted a contrast between these peaceful natives and these hardcore Marines with their big giant M60 machine guns, right? Uh, reminiscing of Vietnam, reminiscing of uh, cowboy versus Indians and so forth. And that's what he was trying to push for Avatar. So there was, a, there was a design reason behind those 1960s guns in the future. So I think this particular IP is very similar in which we're using gun technology from you know a few hundred years ago and still using it in the future because it has a certain storytelling aspect to that so uh, anyways here's some of these i'll put all these up on on, on the uh, internet somewhere so you guys could look for that so maybe some when they change their clothes what it looks like and so forth um i'll also show you some early the first phase of the spaceship um designer actually went and did some of these and i thought this is what i was talking about in terms of safe design 
right? We could always go back to these. Because when I first saw these, I go, look, let's keep these. They look pretty badass. They totally work. But this could also work in a variety of other people's IPs. We could put this in uh, most science fiction video games and they'll work totally fine. So that means for a film, they're not iconic enough. They don't stand out. They still, uh, n nothing wrong with the painting. And I actually had that happen on, on films, which director is saying, hey, this looks great. This is awesome but not for my film, you know what I'm saying? Or uh, leave it as a piece of art, but it's not, it's design-wise, it's not there yet. So from here, this is where I started tweaking it and got ourselves into, into this, which I thought is way more iconic. And it's always easy to take this and turn it into this. It's much harder to go from this and go, you know what, it's not cool enough yet, it's not iconic enough, and try to take this into this. So generally, we try to push for this early in the design phase, and if the directors and everyone thinks it's too far, okay, we could pull back and get ourselves back into something along this realms. So for those younger designers out there, um, when you're learning about this kind of stuff, uh, my actual advice is don't try too hard yet to push for this. This stuff actually will get you a job. Uh, like I mentioned for fantasy, if you draw dragons, castles, and all that type of stuff, it's fine. You, you make that stuff look nice, you probably get yourself a job. Um, and then once you hone in your skills, you have really good design language, you can slowly start to get yourself into a more uh, riskier type of situation. And I mentioned that mostly for portfolio. If you have a portfolio full of very strange designs or a little bit riskier designs, that actually could sometimes hurt your chances of getting jobs in which like this type of stuff, because it is more universally used in you know, uh, most video games, you have a more higher chance of getting in as a junior designer. So, but if you're a senior designer, obviously our job is to try to push for things that are a little bit more riskier in terms of design language. So uh, anyways, that's that. Uh, I also put in some, I, I don't know if how many of you guys are new to design cinema or seen some of my older work, but I'm just gonna pull in a couple older pieces that I've done uh, in terms of science fiction alien type things because I didn't get to the alien designs for this episode so I'll just show you guys some random things that I've done in the past so personally I love this type of stuff like designing other worlds and the creatures on there so these are all these random stuff that I've done in the past many of these are very old this is about let's say 2013 this are three years old four years old here so surface of a planet here's some alien ship designs these are all about three four years old this one's also four years old here uh, here's another alien tech, uh, kind of this green organic uh, thing. This one's quite old too. This is uh, four years ago as well. So uh, I love this kind of, personally, I love this kind of bug, weird uh, um, alien world design. So um, yeah, so if I was doing a video game, this is the kind of direction I'll take it for the alien tech. Here's more. So this is super old. This one's like seven, eight years ago. Uh, the idea here is actually a bunch of little small ships. These guys combine together to make a mothership and when under attack they'll separate and become a uh, small ship so you guys can see that these three are here so here's one there is two and this is three back here so three of them combined to make a giant capital ship which i thought was a fun idea uh something i haven't seen too much of i think at least back in uh, seven years ago okay here's more little spaceships here's more alien life forms and this one's under the water some funky fish uh, more alien world, planet surfaces, bugs, and so forth, and all these weird fun stuff. Here's a more alien ship. This is back to those uh, those green things I liked. Uh, how old is this one? This one's also this two three years ago as well. So um, this weird. I love these little bubbly things and these little twisty things. Everything looks like armor and bugs and things. Uh, just my personal uh, interest in this type of design. It's kind of green sheen of some kind uh, so it looks like those fly you know the the, uh, the abdomen of flies that funky funky material so uh, that's what these ideas sort of came from um, yeah kind of fun shapes there uh, let's see okay some cyberpunk looking thing this is something I did recently for a class demo so this is more the this is not really science fiction I guess you call it but aliens attack earth and then a bunch of marines go uh, boom, 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 you know, go and go and fight them on the streets uh, of Paris in this case. Uh, here's a more alien ships. So this one's a mind reader. So the uh, humans attach themselves to this thing, and then they use their mind to control these uh, whatever these things are. Some kind of flying uh, drone ships. All right, here's some other ones. It's a lot of fun stuff out there. So science fiction really it opens up the canvas to a lot of possibilities, and it's all really just in the imagination of mixing the known and the unknown, and put it together. And if you find that 
perfect jelling point, you have yourself a marketable idea. And that's what uh, so makes science fiction sometimes very, very hard. Here's a few more. We'll run through these pretty quick, so we uh, don't take up too much time here. A lot of these are just super old things. All right, some hovercraft. This one's more like uh, a post apocalyptical Mad Maxi type stuff. Other things, little hangers. So, and I'm what the reason I'm showing you guys this is because science fiction, like I mentioned in the first episode, there's so many ways you could go down this road. There are so many different genres of science fiction or you know, cyberpunk and near future, far future, post apocalyptical. So, when you get onto a project, it's really um, you gotta spend some time finding that angle uh, and be diverse enough to be able to take on all sorts of different. Uh, subject matter so smoking bug this is kind of my take on Alice the Wonderland the smoking bug on the alien planet so here's his uh, driver um, this dude's smoking a, a pipe here these are early demos of another cyberpunk -y type of world this one's an early demo I didn't make it to finish it this one's a pure alien world so you can see my influence of insects and shrimps and uh, lobsters and these type of things playing a major part in a lot of my design languages Here's an old one as well. So a shrimp thing, whatever this mech is, uh, the pilot out here is uh, taking a break, roasting a lizard for himself and uh, watching guard while his mech is sitting on top of a mountain looking over the terrain. Here's some alien mechs. So this is super old. How old is this? Oh, it's seven years ago as well. So, you know, what if aliens have some mech? What do they look like? So I was really into this bubble thing for quite a while back in about six, seven years ago. This kind of bug. Um, here's the fly materials I was mentioning earlier. This kind of uh, green reflective surface that I really like. Okay, here's some comps. Alien spaceships. Right, here's uh, I did this for Imagine Effects actually. So part of the same world, all kind of bug-like, and all these shields they, they make noise, generate ch -ch -ch, you know kind of like crickets and how they generate the noise. So all these little plates are vibrating. So actually those are designed cinema episodes as well. So all right, last batch and we wrap this stuff up. All right, well, I have no idea what we'll do next next episode, but uh, maybe we'll paint something. I haven't done a live demo in quite a while, but just because I don't have time these days. So anyway, so here's another alien spaceship or some kind of uh, capital ship that's all painted red, which is not very common in a lot of uh, science fiction. Right? They tend to go gray or neutral. It's a safer design, uh, this safer color. But I thought, hey, you know, why don't we do like a fiery red spaceship uh, just to see what it looks like. Here's a black and white spaceport. Here's kind of like a 1980s alien design, which personally I like. It's about the same thing as Cyberpunk, which all your computers are from like the 1980s, you know, all these big buttons and the UI comes out one like DOS style, uh, one letter at a time. So, because I grew up in this time period, so I don't, I'm not sure about the younger generation. Uh, I, I'm much older than a lot of you guys. So I grew up in the time of Alien and Blade Runner and so forth. So I've been heavily influenced uh, by those IPs. So I also like those things. I also grew up with a lot of European graphic novels. So those have a very similar language as these type of stuff. So uh, here's a class demo of who knows what these are. <laughs> Alien spheres taking over the earth and scanning some wild horses that's walking around Tokyo. Um, this is a generic spaceport. There's no design here. This is just generic as you could get. This was a class demo just for students. So zero design here. Just uh, you know, generic spaceport. That's that's what this one is. A Mac. Here's another generic city. Not much design here. This is a design cinema thing actually. Um, design cinema stuff. This part I imagine effects. So all these plates are. Ch -ch 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 -ch. That, that's kind of cool. So when it, when the machine gets uh, hot, all these plates will open up to let the air in to cool it off. And then when it's traveling fast, all the plates will close up. Uh, something interesting. Uh, another old demo, seven, eight years ago, doing some alien spaceship based off of an octopus. And um, just a very strange world that this IP is residing in. So flying bugs, you can tell. I like bugs, I like machines. You put that together, you get uh, you get this language here. All right, this should be the last one here. So last one here, this is off of Hyperion book. This is actually one of my favorite pieces, one of the hardest pieces actually done. I don't even actually like the result of it. The end result came out 
not my favorite, but I do like the idea behind it a lot. So this book, it has a flying tree as a spaceship, which is when I read it, I was like, this is ridiculous, man. It's much, it must be so hard to pull this off in the film. But I thought, why not give it a try? You know, this is a pretty hard design challenge. So I give it a try. So this is a flying sh uh, tree spaceship. It's a living spaceship. So here's a mini room with all the dudes here around a table, all the weird controls. So the ship is alive. And a lot of these forms I got from looking at rose buds before it becomes a flower. They form these very interesting little buds. So that's where I got these kind of cockpit designs from. So you can see here as well. So it, and the leaves are alive. The tree, I mean, the book does mention that all these leaves are vibrantly green. So I put the sun back lit it. So you get this kind of uh, foresty feel, even though we're in space. Very strange design pretty tricky to pull off this is something that uh, you're gonna have a hard time selling this to producers even if they license this ip maybe they're just making the green spaceship versus a tree who knows it all depends on the bravery of whoever you're working with to make these decisions but uh, as a designer we have to try these things are difficult but that's what our job is is to try to pull off things that uh, somebody hasn't done before so anyways this will be a nice image to wrap up on this whole entire episode of design cinema or the series uh, science fiction design i hope you guys liked it and leave your comments questions and uh yeah we'll do something pretty fun for the next episode maybe paint something or change the subject entirely and do something a little bit more hands-on versus showing you guys slideshows of things so um yeah let me know and i also thought about put, bringing podcasts back because i'm so busy uh, our podcasts actually had a lot of views so that's something i'm also considering doing so thank you guys for the support please like our video subscribe and all those youtuber things that they say so uh, of course i help our channel so thank you guys and i'll see you guys on the next episode this is things you speaking see you guys soon bye, -bye.